All good. Um, Okay, so my name's Chris O'Neill. I am known as Chris O on Drupal.org, and I've got other social media stuff somewhere, but I don't really like it, so it's not on the introduction. Um, this talk's called Scaling Humans for Complex Drupal. Um, just before we begin, my goal was to give you a few deeper meaningful thoughts, I guess, more than anything else, um, to prompt you to think about a bunch of issues uh, reflect on how they might apply to where you work. Um, I'm looking to hopefully reach people who are either in a large organisation or something that an organisation that's growing, uh, facing an expansive sort of a project, and also people who work in agency space or in other environments who are looking to shift perhaps from a small to medium enterprise into something larger and uh, I guess get your head around some of the issues that that change when you move between uh, hobby sites and small business things to, uh, to things on a bigger scale. Um, the talk I've got prepared in 29 or so slides is largely my observations and, and thoughts. Um, I'm not going to sort of present you with any particular workflow or methodologies that have oodles of theory behind them because I didn't research that and I'm not particularly interested. It's more just a case of things that I've seen um, in my career um, that I think are either interesting or dangerous and frequently both. Um, the talk is not specifically about Drupal. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is applicable to things outside Drupal, but I think it works, it dovetails well with the sorts of environments that Drupal finds itself working in. Um, Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to cover just a little bit about me first. Um, I'll give a snapshot of some of the ideas and the concepts that made me submit this as a proposal. Um, explore in a little bit more detail some of the considerations and throw out a few anecdotes, uh, some of which may be anonymised and some of which I'll be proudly telling people who they are. Um, and if there's any time at the end, I'd be more than happy to have a very robust and argumentative discussion about how everybody else has solved this problem before. Um, okay, so at the moment I am the team lead for Asia Pacific or APAC or Asia Pacific Japan or APJ, depending on which way you'd like to spin it, uh, for the support engineering team within Acquia. Um, Acquia is a company of about 600 people now, I think, uh, in about 300 different countries. Uh, we have a ever-growing presence in Australia. We've got uh, a technical hub around the Brisbane region and we've got people in Canberra and Sydney, um, in New Zealand, Adelaide, um, yeah, all over at the moment. So and I think we're hiring. So yeah, check the hiring page on the Acquia website and please snag yourself some money because our company tends to pay money to people who refer CVs in rather than automatically go out to recruiters and stuff. So yeah, ka um, I've been there for about two and a half years, I think, thereabouts. Um, before that, I was with Brisbane City Council for quite a long time. I was the technical operations and also the content operations manager, uh, which meant that I sort of had a finger in just about all parts of the pie for a particular business unit at BCC uh, called OurBrisbane.com. We ran a website for about a decade or so, uh, which started out being quite different to how it ended up. Um, but it was effectively a leisure and lifestyle uh, portal um, thing, really. We had about 100,000 nodes. Um, we had about uh, seven or 800,000 unique visitors a month and, I don't know, five million page impressions, that sort of scale, uh, which was pretty cool. And we built it on Drupal and taught ourselves much the same as a lot of people, I think, do, uh, how Drupal works back in the day. Unfortunately, that folded when BCC started running out of money, um, and so I took the jump to the private sector, and I'm still able to pay my mortgage, so this is a good thing. Um, most of what I do now, and also what I've done there, is really on the boundary between a technical role and a non-technical or a business role, um, or a management sort of role. I, I, I stay just enough nerdy, I guess, to be useful to some people and just enough managerial to be delegated things at the other side. So I guess that's my perspective. I'll just give you a, a, a quick note about the organisation where I work 
now. Acquia Support is, um, we're part general practitioner, part consulting physician specialist, uh, part ambulance driver. Um, we tend to help people when their site search results really suck. Um, we help people who find that their website is crashing every Thursday at 1 p.m. and they don't know why. Um, we'll help them figure that out. Um, we'll rescue them from distributed denial of service attacks or bad <coughs> deployments and things like that. Uh, if they're hosted with us, um, we try and remain the calm person who knows what to do uh, in those situations. And we primarily work with our operations engineering team uh, who are able to reboot things um, with impunity uh, and our account managers. So that's a sort of day-to-day -day thing. Uh, we also know a lot about Drupal tips and techniques and best practices and that sort of stuff. And so we do consulting uh, and explain to, to people how they can get more out of what they are doing. Um, basic performance tuning, bottleneck discovery, those sorts of things. Um, our customers are global. What we do in Australia is partially servicing the local market during local business hours, which is kind of handy. Uh, but also we do a lot of emergency work for people uh, all over the world. Uh, if something really hurts and it's the end of the day for the United States, um, our colleagues over there will pass things to us and we'll keep hacking on them until the problem goes away or the customer falls asleep, whichever is you know, preferable. Um, but enough about me, you're the ones with the websites. I'll go through a quick list of um, what I'd see as sort of a typical hierarchy of uh, the, the evolution of the growth of, of different scale websites. Um, this is not obviously comprehensive, um, but it, you know, it may be a, a useful illustration to sort of um, to give us a better idea of what I'm going to speak about in a little while. Um, at the sort of smaller end, you have uh, marketing microsites, campaign sites, uh, what you might call brochureware, that sort of thing. Uh, the main requirements for this sort of thing are going to be content production related, uh, very heavy on getting the theme perfect and pretty, um, concerns around getting the hosting stable and ignorable and making sure your analytics are, are in place. And that's pretty much you know, as hard as it sort of tends to get. Um, Slightly more com complicated from that, you might have what's called a user-generated content platform or a Web 2.0 site, um, events calendars, blogs with comments, those sorts of things. Uh, at that point, you're starting to think about things like identity of Joe Public users and how they're going to interact with the site, um, spam controls, content security, those sorts of things that you don't have uh, something slightly more simple. Um, there's a web application, something like a basic e-commerce website, uh, perhaps some specific business logic that, um, that you need to implement. Your requirements now are going to have slightly more complicated architecture. Uh, you may have web service in integrations, so payment gateways, back-end systems that you need to talk to that are outside um, the direct sphere of your control, um, or at least within the one application architecture. Um, before you know it, you end up in what I've awkwardly called, I hate the word portal, but it's kind of the right word, I suppose. Um, if you've got an integration of a whole bunch of different sites uh, and applications, perhaps you've got external identity, identity management at this point, uh, single sign-on, uh, single source of truth in terms of content that needs to be shared out across a bunch of different places, uh, mobile applications, uh, semantic relationships between your content, um, you know, trickier or more complicated um, specific things like personalization engines or uh, external search if you know, your internal application can't handle it and you need to look at something like Apache Solar or a Google search appliance. Um, so things do tend to get complicated to a point where you might find yourself um, owning this big behemoth um, platform that's really a combination of all sorts of technologies that kind of work together most of the time, are very hard to fit on a single A4 piece of paper. Um, a lot of enterprises will build something like this, whether they intend to or not. Uh, sometimes it's given a name, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes uh, it'll have a two-year lifespan, sometimes it'll have a 10-year lifespan. Uh, in <coughs> Brisbane City Council, when I joined, I think um, we still had a mainframe in the basement that was, had been running since 1975 or something. So you know, it, it can get a bit hairy. Um, so how do you keep all that spinning? How do you keep that governance? Uh, when you've got that much complication. So like all complicated things, you need to break them down into separate parts. 
um, and things naturally will at that scale. Uh, there's, there's no one system that's going to handle everything, despite what some vendors might have to say. Um, Technologies end up in their separate functions, and you might have best of breed solutions for different parts of it, um, and you're looking for how those things are going to integrate. And you start to use cool words like middleware. Um, people, I find, tend to go the same way. In a smaller organization, you tend to find um, more generalists, people who are just good at tech things and people who are good at business things. Uh, they segregate out and you'll find yourself with a database specialist and a network specialist and an operations procurement specialist. And all these little discrete specializations start popping up. So um, just as the, the technology, the people, I guess, um, get complicated with that. As well as that, you end up looking for vendor relationships that serve a similar sort of a, a model. You end up with people who specifically engage with your business in a, in a partnership or in a sales sense. Uh, that look after their little discrete chunk uh, and something needs to be managing what those processes are. Um, relationships are going to develop between these people uh, and these organisations as well. Frictions do occur, collisions happen, it gets very confusing and messy, um, office politics. Um, so yeah, the sort of problems that tend to, to pop up once your stuff begins to scale, uh, it can be around workflow, it can be around strategy, around governance. Um, Drupal itself starts out kind of simple. You've got pages that are published or unpublished. Um, you can build things within Drupal uh, using Contrib or, uh, or your own code to complicate that and build up content workflows. But you know that works to a certain extent. A lot of organizations require things far in excess of what Drupal can handle, they're looking for content staging, they're looking for um, reviews that involve um, people in different parts of the world, you know, interacting with different things, content moving in all sorts of different directions at once. Um, it it kind of gets hard and it technically gets very buggy. Um, there's a higher scrutiny on budget, often a whole lot more paperwork involved once you start to complicate things. If you're in a management sense, it gets kind of expensive um, and annoying and sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's, you know, it's imposed from above. Visibility. Um, anything that's big and expensive is on the radar. Organisationally, you will find that people tend to be aware of what you're doing a whole lot more um, than they may have done, even of the discrete components, uh, if you're aggregating stuff not just internally in terms of stakeholders, but publicly as well. Generally, the stuff that you're building when you're building things at scale is in front of a lot more people, um, and that can get people on your side, in a management sense, a little bit pencil sharpened sometimes. Um, especially if people are new to a role, they will be eager to impress, and they'll be looking for everything to work perfectly, and can be a little bit muppet flail when things don't. Just a quick note as well, um, it's uncommon, I think, to have a completely greenfields environment where you are building something gigantic and beautiful from nothing. Most of the time you're inheriting either existing technology that needs to be moved or ported or converted into some other infrastructure or platform, um, or you're combining um, earlier business logic uh, an earlier system that might not even be a technical one um, that's got its own quirks and you're putting that into a, a software system for the first time. Um, when something's old, it has technical debt. And technical debt, if you're not familiar with the term, is basically all the shortcuts that you ever took coming back to bite you over time. Um, things do get a little bit hairy. The gap between what a system can do when it's implemented and what the business actually needs it to do widens over time. So the requirements are going to drift. Um, compromises over time are going to be either bolted into the system or ignored and, it, and it, it's no longer suitable. So everything has a lifespan, I guess. Um, it sort of leads to a paradox because a lot of the time for systems, complicated systems that are being brought in, it's because everybody who's an existing user hates the old system and they find all these horrible short, um, shortcomings with it. But as soon as you start to replace it, they're going to hate your system even more because it doesn't do the stuff that the old system used to do, um, even if it's you know, 
clunky and horrible, it's familiar. So yeah, basically you can't win, you're screwed and hopefully you're getting paid. So as teams grow, um, what we find is that the more moving parts that are in play tend to mean that you need to have newer systems or more what you might call best practice systems. Um, we still see a lot of companies who work with us uh, who engage vendors who are not familiar with using revision control systems for code, for example. They've never used Subversion or Git. Um, and that can be a, a, a big step up. When you're operating at scale, you really need to have a system in place, technical systems to, to handle that sort of stuff. When you've got a lot of integrations in, and moving parts in your technology, you're also probably going to be building an awful lot of tests for it. Um, if you are clever and on the front foot, those are going to be uh, as widely as possible, software tests, things you can automate. Um, you'll have infrastructure, continuous integration, continuous delivery systems that will stop you from having to check 500 things every time you push a button. Um, but again, that's, uh, it, it sometimes seems second nature to those of us who've worked in that environment for some time, but it's worth considering that there's this enormous amount of the market of vendors who don't do this and don't think like that and are far more familiar with using FTP to simply move things you know, into to place where they need to go. Um, incidentally, I think there's a session tomorrow morning on both of those topics on continuous delivery and Git, so um, free plug for whoever's speaking tomorrow morning, I think, uh, on those. Go and do it if you're unfamiliar. Um, so yeah, you need systems and controls around how these things are going to work. Uh, this stuff doesn't just magically happen. Somebody needs to make decisions about what changes are deployed, um, what the flow of the code's going to be. When things are going well, that's a complicated enough task as it is, but when things break, it gets even harder. Um, who gets called in when something breaks? How, who does the calling in of those people? How do you know if something breaks in the first place? So failures usually boil down to unexpected interactions between components. Um, something that comes up an awful lot more than one might think uh, is code in somebody's Drupal site that relies on code coming out of some other thing, whether that's a back-end service within the business or it's a data feed from some other web service somewhere or whatever it happens to be. Um, without going into the architectural questions of it too much. When you make a request in Drupal, if Drupal is designed and coded in such a way to make a call out somewhere else, get the answer, come back and then build you a page and deliver it to your customer, that doesn't work if the thing over there is broken and suddenly you don't have a problem with just a missing picture of the weather forecast in the corner of your screen. You have a problem with the entire page being broken because all of your PHP is now just dead. Um, that happens uh, too many times a day, I think. Um, and yeah, we get a call and we sort of have to apply heart massage and chop some legs and feet off and things uh, where we can. There's a related concept to that as well. It's really common for people to fire off a campaign that's going to be wonderful and drive traffic to their site. But if that's initiated from a part of your organization or some other organization that isn't talking to the team that's handling the technical side of it, they might do something a little bit naughty, like put a click tracking unique identifying number on the end of the URL, which then breaks all of your caching, which means that this perfectly beautiful and low tested website, which can handle 10,000 pages a second, suddenly is sending every one of those 10,000 pages to your poor fleshy underbelly over there and your site, again, will tank. Again, that's something that can be easily solved at a technical level, but if your people aren't talking to each other and aren't planning the whole solution around that, um, it'll quickly bring things unstuck. Um, there's more straightforward examples, I guess, just not load testing in the first place. Um, not having arrangements in place to upsize to more servers or larger servers, you know, in times of crisis, that sort of stuff. Even down to running your own uh, search crawler and having it trigger 
you know, several times a second on your own site. We've got a, um, a customer at the moment who keeps falling over because uh, they have a uh, Google search appliance, which is a thing that Google will sell you that gives you search across your own stuff using their infrastructure. Um, but yeah, 99% of the traffic that actually hits their site is coming from their own search appliance and killing it. So it's a problem. Um, sometimes bad things happen to you in the middle of the night just to punish you for being Australian. <coughs> um, if you're not familiar with what that refers to, in October last year, there was a bug discovered in Drupal 7 that, oh, how do I summarise it, um, basically took the pants off every Drupal 7 website in the world. Um, it was about seven hours or so before, after the fix for it was released, which was sort of middle of the day on a Wednesday in the States, at the predetermined pre time, uh, before people figured out, okay, well, if that's a fix, how do I exploit it for people who aren't patched yet? And then exploits started happening. And um, the particular nature of the exploit left no trace at all that you'd been hacked and you could have all your stuff stolen and it could be really embarrassing and dangerous and yeah, no fun. So these are really common things and they're going to happen to everybody to some extent at some point. The problem isn't so much predicting all of the technical quirks in advance, it's about having systems and people in place to best react to stuff when it does happen um, so that you can recover from them quickly and cheaply. Um, that Twitter account turned up like a week ago and it's really funny. Um, none of this ever happens on our side though, our status is perfect. But I'm sure this has happened to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, so if something's wrong with an undocumented system or something that's very complicated, sometimes it's just beyond the capability of the team that you've got at the moment to fix it, even if they had all the time in the world. Um, we had a customer about a month ago um, who fell into this sort of a situation. It was kind of complicated the way they got there, but uh, a long story short, they had a, um, our systems are set up so you've got a production chunk of hardware over here and we also provide some development and staging environments over here. And you can do things in these development and staging environments in a much more loose way to help you build your things quickly than you can in your production system. Um, what this customer had done was they had a code base for their production site that was supposed to run over here. Another business requirement came along and they needed an intranet for, for you know, just nothing. 50 staff, maybe 100 staff max, one user a day if you're lucky. Um, it just so happened that those 50 or 100 staff were all like the exec level people. And it was expensive and hard because they were a big organisation that, you know, had to go through a procurement cycle. So rather than figure out a way to find some stable hosting, they put this little intranet thing on the staging environment and just left it there. And it worked really well for a year. They got uh, a different vendor involved entirely from the people who sort of managed the main code path and put this other vendor, I think, in place and given them the keys to the staging machine. Except they didn't have all the tools set up, so all they were doing was hacking on the files live and just leaving them there. Um, again, worked perfectly well. Nobody noticed, uh, least of all this customer until we had to reboot this machine because a uh, security patch for something came out. And when the machine rebooted, a year's worth of unsaved work disappeared because it wasn't captured anywhere in our configuration systems and stuff, it wasn't in code. So they rolled back a year and their system just went bang. And figuring out how that had gotten to that point was really fun and took me a day, but Apparently they're like onto it now, and it's never going to happen again, and it's going to be beautiful. Um, yeah, but these are you know these are not small organisations as well. They, yeah. It's just you can see how one shortcut here made perfect sense because it solved a business problem they had three hours to resolve, and then they just forgot about it. Um, yeah, good fun. So aside from taking shortcuts with documentation uh, and things internally. Um, 
typically you'll go through a phase where something gets built, it'll be under warranty for a while, maybe 90 days, 30 days, whatever the term is, where the building people are responsible for <coughs> defects that happen. And then a door closes and you're in maintenance phase. It may be that you've got an outside vendor to do the build and now it's your in-house team that has to maintain this thing and you're not anticipating any new changes or big functionality or whatever. Um, can the people that receive that system build the system again themselves if they had to? Yes, it would take time and yes, it would be expensive and all that stuff, but you know, what, what's missing here? What are, you, what are you abandoning in the first part that you don't have? What's the, the air gap there? Um, that can be true even if it's within one organisation. If you find that you've brought a vendor in who doubled their staff for a 12-month contract to build you something, um, and then the contractors within that company have disappeared, how much of the knowledge have they got? Could the same vendor that you had spent that year with build the same thing for you again, or fix the same thing for you again six months from now, uh, when you come to, a, come to them with a new question? Uh, and are you paying to sustain that? Um, it's worth, where are we, 26 minutes. It's worth taking the time to have a think about what capabilities you have in your team versus outside your team. Um, we have another customer who, they operate a forum for their own customers on Drupal hosted with us. They discovered that one of their users had uploaded a question on the forum with an attachment saying, can anybody help me interpret this? And that attachment was a penetration test for their company with like all the badness and it sort of probably got them fired, but uh, our customer who was hosting this forum had to like <laughs> pull it down. They figured out, oh, maybe we should check for this. Their legal team then went through and found like two years worth of really badness in like all these forum posts. Where we got involved was that the customer realized they didn't know how to delete from Drupal. And they had a really good build team who put the site together. They had a really good support team, which was us, to keep sort of things ticking all over, uh, ticking over. What they didn't know was how to run their own system. Uh, so they came panicking to us and we fixed it and worked with them, which is outside the scope of what we normally do, but we're really nice and you know, we're all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, it left it sort of hanging and not really fun for anybody. Uh, but now we have some really cool shell scripts that we've shared with them and we're like, get some nerds and hit that button. And Good fun. Um, okay, so I'm going to just mention quickly a few things um, about designing teams for how people are going to interact and, and that sort of stuff. Um, planning ahead for trouble, the intersection of in-house and vendor teams, what your lines of reporting are, those sorts of things, handling growth. Has anybody heard of the <laughs> Netflix Chaos Monkey? A couple of hands, yep. Um, Netflix developed a script that randomly walks through their gigantic Amazon footprint and switches machines off in production. And they did this because they felt that that was the best way to learn if you actually break stuff and see what happens and see how people react. And they will start fixing things and redesigning them so that if something drops away, the world doesn't end. Uh, and they called it Chaos Monkey, and they really did start switching their own stuff, stuff off in production in about 2011. That idea has since grown into a wider set of scripts called the Simeon Army, which you can download from GitHub and run it on your own stuff if you want to break it, um, which I'm sure is a really advisable thing if you can get permission to do it. But you probably can't. So um, here's a generic looking picture that I downloaded off Google Images. Um, Imagine for a minute that this is your architecture and you've got a red pen and you come along and put a big cross through any random box. Ask yourself whose page it just went off because that box has just disappeared. Um, who's responsible for knowing that that pager or making sure that pager did go off? Um, all the things that are connected to that box, what are they doing right now? Don't feel bad if you don't know. Um, that's kind of the point. Do you know who should know the answer to that question? Does anybody know? Where do they work? Can you reach them on a Saturday? Who decides when to fail over to a backup system? 
do they have the information they need to make that decision or do they need to call someone else? Can you reach that person on a Saturday? Or if you reach both of those people on a Saturday and they're both drunk? Um, so yeah, if you do that a couple of times, you get a sense, I guess, of where your single point sensitivities are. Um, and it's, yeah, perhaps sobering. Okay, so by that title, um, I guess I mean components of your entire stack that are managed outside your team uh, or your company. Some of our customers have an expectation that when something bad happens somewhere, that absolutely everybody will wake up and jump on a conference bridge and you'll have 50 people all muted on a phone line at once uh, around the world, freaking out. Now, um, that's really good for waking people up and getting attention on a problem, but it doesn't necessarily solve it faster. It can, but it can also slow down communications. Um, if what makes sense in your organisation as an alarm is the CEO getting angry at you or a customer tweeting, you want the people who are responding to that, the first, pe the first person to, to receive that information to be able to solve it themselves or to know who to call to get that fixed. Um, One thing to be careful of as well is that if you've got a team internally and a team at the other arm of a long vendor relationship, it's really easy to believe and get more information from the people that you have close to you than the people at the other end. Um, occasionally, we suspect that some of our customers who are flailing and have really badly developed applications are pinning the blame on us and saying it's an infrastructure thing, their database keeps crashing, when really they've done embarrassing things. Um, so yeah, you want to be able to react to issues as efficiently as you can without leaving unmonitored gaps. Um, one of our customers is Pfizer. Uh, they do this really well. They have a tiered system where the first people that deal with the problem understand you know, X level of stuff and they have a process for then escalating things to us with an Acquia support. We'll solve whatever we can once we find out that it's actually a code level thing or it's something that we need business specific knowledge about. Uh, we have a different team that we refer to, and those processes are, are documented. Sounds slow, sounds laborious, but it actually works really well. Um, it leaves a, a good paper trail, and it means that uh, only the right people uh, really uh, are aware or, or having to deal with things uh, at the, the right time. See, the sad fact is not everybody knows what they're doing. Um, there's always finger pointing between developers and operations. That's been forever. Um, but an SLA in one part of your organisation isn't necessarily going to be a good fit for the SLA you have in another part of your organisation. There's nothing worse than having a five minute response or a resolution time for this part of the system if you're bound to wait until Monday for that other thing that it relies on. Uh, so yeah, keeping track of that. So I'll try and speed up a little bit. Um, yeah, if you're planning what your um, support and crisis documentations like, share that with the other people, get everybody to agree it, but don't mess with it too often because people in a crisis are going to go with what they remembered and who they called last time and they're just going to do that. So they're not going to look back through their emails and, and find out you know, the subtle tweaks that have, have changed. Um, skip that one. Yeah. Um, as I said before, uh, people who built the architecture, are they going to inherit it forever? Are they, are they, be, are they still on the line for you? Um, how quickly is the site evolving from the point of handoff? Um, is it hard for you to bring new people on because all the documentation that was really good has drifted and the application has drifted? Uh, do you find yourself difficult to, is it difficult for you to scale in that sense? When you've got discussions between different vendors, are you talking, um, are they allowed to talk to each other directly or do they need to talk through you? There's pluses and minuses to that. Uh, if your team is able to keep aware of everything that's going on and are learning from that, that can be good. If you're bottlenecking communication that really needs to happen and put two people in touch, uh, that can be a problem as well. Um, yep, save time. Um, So I mentioned to Kyle Frost this morning um, over breakfast that I'd probably throw a slide in, was that okay? And he said, yeah, it's fine. So we're all good. We do some work with Flight Center. Um, they're in here with their name on the board because they're in the good category. Um, Kyle's done, 
Uh, Kyle, 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 exactly. Yeah, you're also that other anecdote of it. No, the the team that the flight center guys have built has sort of grown as their uh, Drupal footprint has grown, as they've absorbed more responsibility and brought more things in. Uh, they've developed that, and I, I feel at least that the team that they've built has been a good fit for the parts of the stack that they're responsible for, um, which you know makes really good sense. I couldn't get. Drupal South Wellington's website to load the other night, so there may or may not be a video of you or something somewhere out there on the internet, but there's definitely like a Prezi thing where you can get motion sickness from watching Kyle intimate. <laughs> get it while it lasts. It's, uh, yeah, that's no, good. Sometimes it feels like Flight Center swallowed about half of the Drupal people in Brisbane, but you know, they're putting them to good use, so that's a good thing. Um, as I mentioned before, we work with Pfizer. Um, there's a talk on YouTube link from that page there. I'll put this on the thing so you can click it rather than memorize it. Um, Mike Lamb from Pfizer talks a little bit about uh, what they've done to build a Drupal platform and also a team. A couple of key points, um, because they run like hundreds and hundreds of stuff, uh, of you know, individual consumer brands and all sorts of stuff with Pfizer. Um, they made the choice to develop um, a panel of Drupal experts rather than a much, much bigger panel of PHP experts, uh, or to go out to a big system integrator and say, just you know, make this problem go away. Um, they have a fairly tight control over uh, their brand guidelines, and they provide a kit to agencies. So like, if they need a, a, a campaign site about a new product launch or something, they'll get another agency, a marketing firm or ad company to build that but they'll give them the parameters so that when they get that back, it's ready to drop into what they do and it doesn't slow them down. Um, and so they can scale that way. At DrupalCon Austin, there's a presentation um, from some of the people from Lullabot and msnbc.com, which is part of NBC Universal. Um, we do a fair bit of work with NBC and uh, across a whole bunch of their stuff, but MSNBC is one of the things that works really well. The, um, the project to build it, they sort of built it basically from the ground up in about nine months. Um, it was led by Lullabot as the sort of primary contractor developer, but they outsourced and partnered with a whole truckload of different agencies. And I think Robert Wolf from MSNBC says in that presentation that, um, yeah, it never would have happened without you know, an army of fantastic project managers. So it can be done. Um, it's worth, worth listening to some of the stuff that, uh, that they have in that talk. Um, and in the couple of moments I have left, um, just a few notes on some key roles and character traits that you might want to hire for. A lot of talk ends up on uh, job boards around Drupal rock stars and Drupal ninjas and whatnot. Um, they're kind of expensive sometimes, they're kind of rare sometimes. Um, they can be really fantastic, uh, but make sure they're working on the, you know, the things that they're really best at uh, and you're not trying to, to get the world's third best themer to also troubleshoot Memcached for you or something. Um, the same sort of stuff's really true if you're really good people as well. Um, whether they've got some monstrous uh, global profile or whether they're just shit hot in your organisation, um, obviously hang on to them. but. I find there's the, the myth of the whole sort of 10 times engineer or 10 times architect, somebody who's worth 10 times the average developer. I don't really buy into that, that's, that any one person can be that much more productive, but it's certainly true that one person in your organisation might be 10 times better than all of the other people in your organisation. Um, watch out for people who are really good because as the gap between them and the rest of the team widens, um, those people can get bored if they're only ever teaching and they're not you know, getting stimulated from the rest of their group as well. So that's good fun. Um, some people work really well remotely, some people don't. Um, yeah, I work remotely. My dogs like it. Um, at Acquia we hire for humility, really keenness to learn a lot more than anything else. Technical skills are hugely important, but technical skills if somebody's achieved technical skills, it's because they've got other skills and character traits, I guess, that, uh, that lead them to that point. 
glue people. Um, spare a thought for people who've got a foot in the business and tech, or perhaps the tech and the customer space. They might not actually be your go-to people for any one particular you know, attribute, but they know what's going on. And yeah, that's a, I don't know, he, he, he's got cool teeth. Um, yeah, develop people in that space. If they're in a junior position, like cultivate that. Um, don't force people to pick a career path that turns them into a PHP something or other, or a you know, senior business analyst of something, uh, if that's not the, the way they do. Exploit the fact that you know, we're analog, we're not digital in, in, in that sense. Um, technical account managers as well, sort of fit into that. Um, having what's effectively an extension of your organization inside a vendor's organization is really kind of handy sometimes. Um, we sell technical account managers to people and they grease an awful lot of wheels uh, and bang a lot of pots and pans on our side of the fence on behalf of their customers. Uh, likewise, we use a technical account manager with Amazon um, because we really need attention on stuff from time to time and it's kind of handy. So yeah, they're good people. Uh, watch out for partnerships as well. Um, I've been lucky to work with a bunch of really good people over time, but I've found that the combination of individual people sometimes makes a huge difference as well. Um, I've had a good business analyst and developer architect relationship where those two roles really sort of dovetailed and, and fed off each other, and we got sort of great results from that. Um, and I see that quite often. So yeah, don't think in terms of individuals as much as the systems that you have and the people. Um, software archaeology is a thing. It's got its own Wikipedia page. Um, if you are doing anything complicated, there is background research, there's digging in old systems, there's digging in um, business processes and gathering requirements and discovering what the heck's actually going on, uh, whether it's waterfall or agile or whatever your methodology is. You know, these people are doing it and you're going to miss something uh, if you don't pay attention to the people who do that. Uh, and if you spend a dollar on them when they're needed, it's worth $10 when you get to user acceptance testing. And security people. Uh, getting external security audits is a really good idea. It's how bugs get picked up. It's how um, things that everybody has missed for years get caught. Um, the Drupal horror thing that I mentioned before, that was caught by an external security audit. You know, many, 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 many people have had Drupal audited from top to tail over the last several years. And it was just this one guy who figured out that you could shove a, um, a whole bunch of SQL into the key of a key value. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, don't be surprised, just a couple of do's and don'ts. Uh, don't be surprised by 50 pages of boilerplate stuff from a security analyst saying low, medium. Um, they're sort of paid by the kilogram, I think, sometimes. Um, but do have somebody on board who can make sense of that and understand what's a real issue, what's um, you know, what's something that needs to be prioritised, what's something you can make a difference on, what are you simply going to have to work around. Don't flick reports that come from security analysts out to um, vendors blindly and just ask them to comment on it. It's expensive and you'll get told our systems are fine, nothing to see here. Um, except from us, we don't respond like that. Um, yeah, bake your security into the design. Um, like any consultancy, aim for people on your team to learn from it whenever you talk to some external people. Uh, make everybody else better. Um, and at the end of the day, just remember that absolutely everybody is paddling with duck feet under the water just like you are and we're all faking it. <laughs> um, 15 seconds for questions. Excellent. <laughs>